53 BC, a Roman army set out to conquer the kingdom of Parthia, the gateway to the riches of the East. I'm Matthew Settle. This army didn't go into battle for the greater good of the empire. They did it to enhance the reputation and wealth of one man, Marcus Licinius Crassus, the richest man in Rome. Crassus led 35,000 Romans into the Parthian desert. The Parthian general Serena, with only 10,000 men, met the Roman invaders at Cairai, the modern-day town of Haran in southern Turkey. Now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wished they had. Now, on decisive battles. In 60 BC, all power in Rome was shared between three men, Julius Caesar, Pompey the Great, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. This arrangement was designed to control their individual ambition and stop Rome from falling into civil war. Crassus was by far the richest, but at 60, he was also the oldest. Crassus certainly was old and we're told looked older at the time of the campaign, around 60 years old, but he still wanted to make an impression. Crassus really was the boy left behind. He did not have the sort of military reputation that he wanted, that he craved. He wanted to be the first citizen in Rome, and to do that, he needed victories. The real glory belonged to Caesar and Pompey. Their military exploits had made them the heroes of the Roman population. But while Caesar and Pompey had been campaigning, Crassus had been getting richer. He was Rome's biggest real estate developer. A unique way of doing business. He assembled his own band of builders and firemen. Most houses in Rome were built of wood and fires were frequent. If a house caught fire, he offered to buy at cut price. The deal done, his firemen put out the blaze and his builders would refurbish the house. Then he sold them for a huge profit. He was even accused of having an affair with one of the Vestal Virgins so that he could get his hands on her house. But his wealth could not buy him the popularity of Caesar and Pompey. Even when he had defeated Spartacus 20 years earlier, Pompey had taken the credit. Then the provinces and armies of the empire were divided between the three men. Caesar received Gaul, Pompey got Spain, and Crassus was given Syria. Now, he saw his chance for glory. Crassus decided to win a claim by expanding the empire eastwards into Parthia, then India, and as far as China into what the Romans called the Outer Sea. The fact that Parthia had a peace treaty with Rome was conveniently ignored. Crassus saw Parthia as an opportunity, as a political opportunity, as a financial opportunity. He was governor of Syria. He, of course, could protect Roman Syria against any threats, and he used that as a opportunity to invade Parthia. In 54 BC, he arrived in Syria. Crassus had always joked, a man doesn't have enough money till he can buy an army and still have some left over. Now he would put his money where his mouth was. He recruited seven legions, 4,000 light infantry, and another 4,000 cavalry. A total of over 35,000 men. His son Publius, who was serving with Caesar in Gaul, arrived to lead the cavalry. In the summer of 54 BC, he crossed the Euphrates and entered Parthia. 
The Parthian king sent ambassadors and offered to let him return to Rome in peace. Crassus replied he would conquer their country. Well, the ambassadors laughed and said that hair would grow on their palms or their hands before that would happen. None of this deterred Crassus. The king of Armenia offered his help on the condition that the army marched through the mountains of the north. But Crassus's plan was to go by the shortest route, straight across the desert. He turned down the offer, and the king and his cavalry rode off. Crassus led his legions on into the arid landscape. It was burning hot. They knew that somewhere, out there in the haze, was the Parthian army. The Parthians were very, very different from the Roman Empire, almost the antithesis. The Parthians were a much more feudal type uh, empire. They were based almost entirely on horsemen. The Parthian army was designed to operate in the wide open spaces of the desert. It would not seek a head-on clash with the legions. That would be playing the Romans at their own game. The Parthians were horse soldiers. Most were mounted archers who fired from horseback. These people were the masters of maneuver. They were swifter than any other cavalry. They could fire their weapons at a gallop, not only galloping towards the enemy, but also even as they galloped away from the enemy, they would turn round and they would fire back over the hindquarters of the horse. And this, of course, is immortalized as the famous Parthian shot. They were supported by the cataphracts, heavily armored cavalry with long spears. The army was led by Serena, a young general in his late 20s. He had 10,000 archers and cavalrymen, and his baggage train contained hundreds of camels loaded with bundles of spare arrows. The Roman army was tired and thirsty and low on supplies, but Crassus remained confident. While he was expecting to run into a Parthian advanced guard at any minute, he believed the main battle was still some days away. But as he arrived near the city of Cari, his scouts told him that the Parthian army was approaching. Crassus was shocked by the news and immediately began to organize his troops into a defensive formation. His general Cassius suggested the legions form a long line to avoid being outflanked. At first Crassus agreed, but then he ordered them into a hollow square which could be defended against an attack from any direction. On each side he placed a wing of cavalry and infantry. One wing was commanded by his general, Cassius. The other by his own son, Publius. Crassus had risked everything to become a battlefield hero and win the riches of the East. Now only death or glory awaited him. 53 BC. Crassus has led seven legions deep into the Asian desert. He wants to be another Alexander the Great and march into India. But at Cari, the Parthian army stands in his way. The Roman army had formed defensive squares. Most of the officers now wanted to rest their troops until the following morning. But Crassus' son, Publius, was eager to fight the enemy. Crassus agreed and urged his army on. His soldiers would have to eat and drink while on the march. Eventually, the Parthians came into view. From a distance, they appeared a ragtag bunch. There was little about them that inspired terror. This was because Serena had ordered his cavalry to cover up their armor with blankets and animal skins. Then, as they came close, he gave the order to throw off the covers. Suddenly, the Romans saw rank after rank of cataphracts, their breastplates and horse armor gleaming in the sun. Serena sent a thousand cataphracts thundering towards the Roman square. But 
this was exactly the kind of situation the Romans trained for. Superbly disciplined, their wall of shields was impenetrable, even to the heavy spears of the cataphracts. Serena realized that the brute force of his heavy cavalry was not going to break down the Roman defenses. He would have to exploit his mobility and firepower. At that moment, the Roman light infantry charged forward. But a hail of arrows from the mounted archers drove them back. It was a taste of what was to come. What happened next was like a scene from a western. Thousands of Parthian horse archers began to surround the square, pouring thousands of arrows into the densely packed ranks. They used the composite bow. The composite bow in the right hands is a powerful weapon. It's made of different layered materials, like wood, horn, and sinew. This gives it more elasticity, which means that it can store more energy when pulled back. Its normal range is around 220 yards. But experiments have shown that an expert hands can be fired to around 440 yards. The arrows penetrated everything, punching through armor and shields. Hundreds of Romans fell. Arms were pinned to shields. Feet were pinned to the ground. They even fired backwards over the shoulder as they rode away. This was the Parthian shot. The origin of our own term, the parting shot. But the bulk of the Romans were still unscathed, sheltering behind and beneath their large shields. Crassus knew that if the square held, the Parthians would soon run out of arrows. This was the problem with archers. They could play a key role in battle, but would eventually run out of ammunition. Missile weapons in ancient warfare were nothing like as decisive as they have become in modern wars because of the low velocity you could guard against them with shields. So it really was just a matter, usually, of outweighting the enemy's missile supplies. But Serena had planned for this eventuality. Hundreds of camels loaded with arrows were brought forward to replenish the archers. The Parthian logistics, the use of camels to bring more water and particularly more armaments in the form of arrows, really just stretched the Romans beyond their limits. Crassus was now in a desperate situation. The trouble was Crassus hadn't had any military experience for the last 20 years. And that was where the great problem was. And he was old. Crassus sent a message to his son Publius and told him to take a thousand cavalry and eight cohorts and attack the Parthian horsemen. Otherwise, the square would be entirely surrounded. When Publius advanced, the Parthians turned and ran. The Romans charged after them. Crassus and Publius thought they had the enemy on the run, but they were in for a dreadful shock. Fifty-three B.C. Crassus, the richest man in Rome, has invaded Parthia. He needs a quick victory to increase his political power back home. His son Publius has driven off the Parthian attack. Publius kept up the pursuit. But when the Parthians were some distance from the main battle, the horse archers halted. Then they were joined by the cataphracts who attacked the Romans from the front. The lightly armored Roman cavalry was cut apart by the heavy spear, while the archers rode around firing arrows from both sides. Publius was wounded. He and the other survivors were driven back to a small hill where they made a last stand under the hail of arrows.
Publius refused to be taken alive. When he went to stab himself, an arrow pierced his hand, so he ordered his armor bearer to kill him with his own sword. The Parthians cut off his head and stuck it on a spear. Several miles back, Crassus was completely unaware of any of this. The assault had eased. He had a moment to breathe. But he did not realize it was at the expense of his own son. He disbanded the square and lined up his troops in normal battle order. At that moment, the Parthians returned. To his horror, Crassus saw the lead horseman brandishing his son's head on a spear. It was a devastating effect to all who saw it. Needless to say, uh, this was rather demoralizing. This was the final disaster for Crassus. He maintained his dignity. He got through the remainder of the day saying, it is my loss, it is not your loss. Fight on. But that night, he collapsed altogether. Now the cataphracts attacked the Romans head on with their heavy spears, while the archers rode around the flanks, raining arrows into the tightly packed formation. Some of the Parthians shoot directly, others shoot arrows up into the air, which will come down from the top, and you can't use a shield simultaneously against both those. They have long range bows and arrows, and the Romans could not close with them. That was the problem. They had to put up with this constant hail of arrows. But it was close to nightfall, and this saved the Romans. Crassus was too distraught to take any major decisions. When it was dark, Cassius and the other commanders decided to move out of their positions and head for the nearby town of Cari. They left behind nearly 4,000 wounded. At dawn, the Parthians rode in and slaughtered all of them. Then the Parthians marched to Cari. Cari is not a big place. There's a large army now crammed within its walls. It's not provisioned for a siege. If the Romans simply stay there, then they're going to run out of food. They have to break away to real safety, which is actually up in the mountains, back in Roman territory. So once again, when the darkness fell, they moved out. But they had gone no distance before they came under attack again. The Parthian archers inflicted massive casualties. But the exhausted Romans kept up a fierce resistance. Crassus's officers covered him with their shields to protect him. But unfortunately, some of the men seem to see the only way out as being to have a peace settlement. And that's where discipline really does start to break down when the Serena seems to offer it. Serena suggested that Crassus meet him to discuss peace terms. The king of Parthia would offer him a truce if he withdrew. Crassus and his troops said, oh, we want to talk. We really want to talk. Everything will be okay. Let's talk, let's talk. Uh, you should talk. Crassus was suspicious, but his soldiers were keen for any chance of survival. The Parthians offered him a horse, and as he mounted it, a scuffle broke out between Serena's officers and his own. In the melee that followed, Crassus was killed. His head and his right hand were cut off. When Crassus is killed, along with some of his chief deputies, the army really is rudderless. And I think it's hard for us to overestimate how difficult it would be for an ancient army far from a camp in adverse circumstances, in a, in a climate that they don't understand. Now there was a general attack on the remaining Romans. A few escaped by fleeing into the hills, but most were killed or captured. Crassus's glittering dream had become a Roman nightmare. Since he entered Parthia, 20,000 Romans had been killed and another 10,000 taken prisoner. His seven legions were no more. Their seven eagle standards had been captured. There was no greater dishonor. 
Serena returned in triumph to King Herodes. When he arrived, the king was watching a play which featured an actor holding a severed head. He threw him the head of Crassus to hold instead. In the space of six months, Crassus has gone from being the richest man in Rome to a prop in a Greek play. Serena didn't live long enough to enjoy his triumph. In defeating the might of Rome, he'd become too successful for his own good. The king saw him as a dangerous rival and had him murdered. Cari really ranks alongside the other great defeats of the Romans. The Battle of Cannae, uh, when Hannibal annihilated eight Roman legions in 216 BC, and the Teutoburg Forest, when Varus had three legions slaughtered by the Germans. So it's a tremendous psychological blow. The death of Crassus did not end the rivalry in Rome. The jealousy between Caesar and Pompey spilled over into civil war from which Caesar emerged victorious. But old loyalties remained. Crassus's general, Cassius, was one of the few who made it back to Rome. And 15 years later, he would be one of the conspirators who stabbed Julius Caesar to death. 